Hi everyone, this is Abel. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today we have a lot of books to talk about, some science fiction, fantasy. It's going to be fun. Let's get ready. The first book I'll mention today is The Exiled Queen by uh, Roxana Arama. There is a 99% chance that I'm butchering that name or surname. Please forgive me if you know exactly how to pronounce it. Let me know. This is um, yeah. Th there's a pattern here. <laughs> In every video I do, I am forced to say that because it's true. I am absolutely horrible with pronunciation of every kind of words in any kind of language but this one is tricky okay let's talk about the book so uh, this is a, a, about a princess called andrada in a, a setting that resembles maybe the um, roman empire aesthetic so it's a bit of, a, of an historical fantasy because it's supposed to be really grounded and be pretty similar to that uh, to what happened during that that period this is about a girl this princess that has this challenging attitude because she wants to be heir to their family but traditional convention says that she cannot because she she's a female of course so somehow she um, she gets the opportunity she seizes the opportunity to do some kind of some kind of trial to become the heir of her family but she failed she failed spectacularly and she ends up uh, uh, as a punishment married off and sent off uh, to another country while her homeland is being uh, invaded by uh, by the, an empire probably romans as far as I can understand from the description of the books. So she has to navigate this really difficult position because she is she's a married woman now, she has responsibility uh, and things to do to... You know, she has a position and a role in the new political context when she lives in. And at the same time, she has to... Uh, she she gets news of, of the fact that the sh that her uh, homeland has been invaded, and somehow she'll have to she'll no doubt try to free herself or influence the pot potential outcome of that uh, conflict in her homeland. It really it is really fascinating for me because as far as far as fantasy goes, the Roman setting it's not unheard that you have some kind of um, low fantasy or epic fantasy that has that kind of aesthetic, but it's not that common. And it's really fascinating for me as a, as a time period, as, a, as an aesthetic, with all the um, specific quirk of that uh, culture, of course, which is really close to home, of course, because I'm in Italy. So I'm really curious to see how it is developed and how the main protagonists will uh, travel through this uh, really interesting and really gritty and really dangerous world so let's see how it goes if you have read it and or if you're going to read it let me know anything about it but i'll absolutely let you know what i think about it in a review hopefully pretty soon then the celestial saga down of the seekers by alex o'connor this is pure space opera, and you see by the, the cover, which is pretty unique. It kind of reminds me of a graphic novel, of a, of a comic too, with the whole cast on the cover. It is pretty unusual, you know, especially for space opera that tend to be much more um, focused on planets or battleships. They, they try to give you this uh, sense of wonder uh, and of epicness and of huge battles. But this one is focused on characters, and that's a good thing for me, <laughs> because as you know, and as I always tell you, I am a character reader, character focused readers. So, if we have this extensive cast on the cover, hopefully we'll have good characters and good character development in the novel itself. So, this is pretty classic as far as I can tell from the description. There is a an alliance of planets that is battling some kind of huge empire and then the, they're chasing a, a, a an enemy leader, the core group, uh, the, the squad team that we're following in, in the story and then they have to 
um, they, they face the possibility to have new alliances, to change the fate of the world, and at the same time there's betrayal, you know, all the good stuff that you have in space opera that makes this subgenre of science fiction so fascinating for every one of us. So, yeah, I'm really curious because the cover is interesting. I know that there is this um, uh, train of talks that we cannot have characters on the covers because we cannot see characters on the covers because they're ugly, because they kill imagination, because we want to figure out how they look in, my, in our mind, and I can understand that. I am the kind of person that when I like and I really enjoy a novel that I'm reading, I have a full board on Pinterest with my fake <laughs> cast, uh, fan a fantasy cast uh, of actors that will potentially be part of some kind of adaptation on TV or cinema. Yeah, I'm a pretty visual person because of my background and in arts and graphic design. So when an, an author or an artist, <laughs> a graphic director uh, for the um, for the cover tries something like this I appreciate it it's a bold move and let's hope that the book is good I'll absolutely let you know pretty soon hopefully then Nomads of the Sea by Kobe Zucker this is an epic fantasy with multiple points of views we have Sig we have Idilia and we have Brain uh, the setting of this novel is in an archipelago with a lot of islands trying to uh, free themselves from the um, governing body, from the rulers. So it's kind of a civil war and we see all of them, all of those um, three main point of view, I don't know if you have more in the novel, uh, they have different positions in the political grand scheme uh, of, of this you know, civil war and some of them are politicians, some of them are trying to uncover new um, lost abilities and, and, and new powers, some of them are trying to reclaim their old position, and it is really fascinating for me because of that kind of setting. Uh, in some way it, it reminds me of what we heard, had in Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin, and I'm ashamed to confess I only read the first book from Earthsea when I was really really young and I remember very little of it aside the vibes and the atmospheres and a few a few moments in the um, a few points of the plot points of that and I should reread it because I have a beautiful edition with illustrations of all the saga in a, in a huge chunker that it's absolutely amazing to see and to, it's a sight to behold. But I digress. I like the fact that we have this kind of, uh, of an unusual setting and I'm pretty curious to see how it works, how it is developed and uh, how those characters um, quite literally <laughs> sail through those difficult uh, land masses. Let's see how it goes. Then we have The Engineer by Varon M. Henshaw. This is a science fantasy, science fiction novel uh, about a man that arrives in a ruined city called Redemption. And he is not in an easy position, he is hunted by riders, ignored by his leaders, uh, there is a deadly mystery uh, beneath the city. And in the cover we have this pyramid that it absolutely looks like a science fiction, a science fiction setting, but it also looks that the novel has this uh, atmosphere of epic fantasy because there are secrets and mysteries to, to uncover um, underneath the pyramid itself. So uh, every time I see a pyramid my interest is peaked <laughs> and if you use that pyramid in a science fiction setting it's even better because I am of the generation who saw uh, Stargate at the theater. A, someone who saw the movie and then exactly at the moment of uh, going out of, of the cinema bought another ticket and saw the movie again <laughs> because it was so incredible especially for the time I didn't watch the TV show but I'm planning to because we finally have it on Prime on Amazon Prime in Italy so 
yeah, uh, that's a fatal mistake. That, that's shameful, shameful for every science fiction <laughs> aficionado. <laughs> but I will absolutely do it and look it again. And somehow, I will say that the atmospheres of this book from the cover, it kind of gives me Star Stargate vibes. I could be totally wrong. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And if you have read it, let me know because this is one. And this one has been out for quite a while. This is the first of a series. We have we already have the second one out. So if you know anything about this book, let me know. Then an epic fantasy book, which is titled Zodak, the Last Shielder by Max Moyer. Moyer, Moyer. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, of course. It's a weird surname that I'm butchering another time. This is about the main protagonist of the story, Zodak, that um, he discovers his future. Somehow, there's a prop prophecy uh, about him, that it's laid out for him, and of course, that influences all of the, his future decisions. And at the same time, he's entrusted with a, a particular medallion because his uncle has been the kidnapped, and he um, goes off and try to, to in search for his uncle. And at the same time, there's a huge war looming, and evil threats um, coming close to the place uh, where he, he lives. He has to go on a quest with, a, with, a, with an unlikely group of heroes. You know, all that classic comfort comforty, comfy <laughs> vibes that we have from Epic Fantasy that we love so much. The cover is amazing. I bet this is from uh, Jeff Brown. Yeah, this one and the Exiled Queen too. I can recognize it. Yeah, because he's, he's becoming so famous and so popular as an artist for book covers that you can tell that's Brad Jeff Brown's stuff. They're all amazing. And they all make me want to buy those books so bad so let's see how this one goes and i'll absolutely let you know pretty soon hopefully taken by erin bowman this is the first book in a trilogy this trilogy was originally traditionally published um, but a few months ago i think erin bowman bowman reacquired the rights of the series and now we have a new brand new edition uh, which is self-published this one is a dystopia and it has all the hallmarks of those that classic period 2012 this um, young adult dystopians that i personally loved so much <laughs> because the, those are comfort reads for me because we have a lot of cliches a lot of um story beats that are so classic and so familiar for me and i love them i gobbled those books uh, with no stop uh, I don't know anything about this series aside what we have in the description. I know that Erin Bowman can write <laughs> because her duology, Contagion, starting with Contagion, which is a um, kind of spooky, kind of a little bit of horror space opera, is amazing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely amazing. You should read Contagion. And I, I mentioned this book in a video about Summer Read because it's, it's a perfect, quick, but at the same time deep. So I'm pretty sure that this one will be pretty good. We have, as I said, all of those hallmarks of um, that kind of teen dystopia, smart teen dystopia. You know, there is a, there is a difference between the books that do it justice and all that um, thumbs and thumbs of books that were tailor-made because it was that period that they, will, they were going to sell well because it was the new wave of books and the new wave, the wave of, the, of a young adult science fiction. But this one sounds so good. We have the Wallet City and we have um, something that will absolutely re remember older dystopian novels because at 18 years old um, something happens there are no adults in this city they're all teenagers there is an event that it is calculated that everyone is going to face it but the protagonists um, will try to escape that fate uh, the mystery surrounding the fact that um, at a certain point everyone suddenly disappears when they click to a certain age okay 
but he knows also that if he tries to climb the, the walls of the walled city, he will most likely die. And if he doesn't try, he will be victim of this event that clicks when you reach a certain age. So it's a catch-21. And the outcome is probably horrible for everyone in any case. But there is a mystery because he has um, someone left him a note that tells him there is, uh, there is a, a, some kind of conspiracy and that the government is corrupt. So yeah, nothing incredibly new, but I'm pretty sure that the execution will be amazing. It was the same for contagion. The idea of a contagion on a colony, disease spreading in a far out post is not brand new, but the execution was really, really good. So I'm pretty sure that this one will be really good too. I will let you know as soon as I read it. And if you have read this, because this, the original edition of this one has been out for quite a while, let me know. Salt in the Wound by Benjamin Averin. This is a post-apocalyptic book, but at the same time mm, sounds like fantasy because it's set in a distant future when uh, mm, there's been some kind of climatic catastrophe and now rain is extremely dangerous. So the few civilization patches that we have, they live in sheltered city trying to stay away from the rain. And somehow this uh, recalls of the last Hideo Kojima game. <laughs> yeah, the last one. We should have Death Stranding 2 next year, maybe. So that aesthetic is amazing. I don't know if we have something similar of an aesthetic in the book, but the concept that you have to stay away from rain because it will probably kill you is incredibly fascinating. So we have this protagonist that he's... Um, trying a treasure which is salt um, which is incredibly precious in that context in the setting of the novel and he wants to sell that uh, salt to pay for shelter for his community probably to um, so that it it become so that it can be shielded from the rain but he got he gets betrayed he loses that the treasure betrayed by his friends so he's torn between the desire for revenge, at the same time he has to uh, recollect that lost treasure and his sense of justice because as far as I can tell he's coded like a good person. So there is justice involved in his train of thoughts. He has to decide how much he is able to give in to his desire for revenge. The cover is really beautiful. We have all of three books already out. And it's really promising. If you have read this book, let me know and I will let you know pretty soon, hopefully. Powerless by Tony Cooper. This is a superhero novel and it has a twist, a different uh, point of view, because this is a from the point of view of a former hero, someone who's been out of the, ga of the game for 20 plus years. So it's a superhero that is living a quiet life now, but he is forced to get back in the game in the worst possible way because his best friend gets killed so he has to investigate and try to understand what's going on and as uh, often happens in this kind of stories that murder is the opens the gate to something different and maybe on a larger scale we we already have three books i think out for this series it's really promising because since I've read the meta from Tom Reynolds, I discovered how much I love books that have superheroes, superhero novels, which are not that popular because we know that superheroes, they live and thrive in comic books. But I really love when authors are able to catch the lighting in a bottle and that exactly those vibes and the rhythm and the dialogues that make superhero comic books and, and movies so fascinating. At least what we have until uh, 10 years ago, maybe, <laughs> when we were in the golden age of Marvel superheroes. But this looks really promising. Uh, the series, as far as I can tell, is complete. So if I enjoyed this one, I'll have the whole series to, to binge read. And yeah, I'll, I'll let you know pretty soon, hopefully. 
And lastly, The Red Frontier by Joseph Cruz. This is a space opera adventure about a um, doctor from the 21st century that uh, awakes in a um, uh, spaceship that is crash landing of, of, on Mars in the far future. So there is this fish out, out of water dynamic that I absolutely love when a character is um, pulled away from his um, uh, natural environment and has to struggle to adapt in a new context, in a new setting. And this setting is Mars, which is incredibly fascinating for me. Anything that has to do with Mars is incredibly, incredibly appealing for me. Something happened in that far future and because we left Earth behind, which is not inhabited anymore. Something happened, some kind of catastrophe. And the future of humanity is on Mars, which is now ruled by some kind of empire. And the fact that this doctor, this, this uh, character exists, is the source of the conflict because no one is supposed to come from, from Earth. And the very same ship that he, that he traveled on, and the, the same ship that, that crash landed on Mars, is um, very much desired because there is some kind of lost technology on that ship. So, he is the, uh, he is in the worst place at the worst moment in, at the center of this kind of conflict. So, this is really fascinating for me. The cover is absolutely amazing. Yeah, incredible. incredible. It piqued my interest just, to, just looking at the cover. And we have um, also a bunch of uh, uh, short stories surrounding this first main installment in the series. So, yeah, I'm really, really excited about this. And I'll absolutely let you know pretty soon. A couple of reading updates. The last couple of weeks have been slow for me reading-wise. I took the last week of August and the first days of September as kind of a vacation. Not really a vacation, but I relaxed a little bit reading-wise. And also I'm reading chunky books, <laughs> really long books, especially the first one. So it will take me a while to finish them, but I'm enjoying them immensely. I'm reading The Curse of the Mistrites, the first book in the Words of Light and Shadows by Johnny Wurtz. And as I told you, I'm loving it. <laughs> if you follow me on Instagram or on X, I've gushed about this book so many times. I think I am around the first 50% mark. And it's been a challenging read because of the language, but not in, not in a bad way, in a really satisfying way. And the vocabulary is, is really rich and the uh, really rich and the writing style is really elegant. And I would say that um, somehow this book um, it doesn't have a bad reputation, but many many persons, many people, many readers, they say that this is incredibly difficult. I wouldn't say that. It is absolutely above many others language-wise. It's more complex. But give it 200, 200 pages and you will absolutely feel at home. Yeah, I, I really think that many people have a really, really small vocabulary <laughs> and this will be really useful for them to, to enrich that vocabulary. I love the character, de character development. This is really, there's a huge cast and in a few moments, especially before to reach this, uh, the 50% uh, uh, mark, there's a section of the book when we have a lot of characters acti acting all together. And a few of the things they do, they're not um, that easily explainable. <laughs> so the book tells you what's going on, but you struggle to understand the full implication of what's going on there. And I think it's by design, because the book is trying to give you a, a few hints of the potential payoff of things happening now. After all, this is a 10 or 11 book books long series so this is supposed to be the uh, fun foundation for all of that so it's a little bit confusing <laughs> I will say uh, around the 35 40 percent uh, mark of the book because of a few specific things happening but otherwise I love the character development the way the world is described 
everything that is happening and the implication that what we are going to see will be huge, will be incredibly deep and, and amazing. Uh, somehow this calls for me more like an epic than a fantasy novel. Because in a way you can, you, um, you know, there's this distinction be be between the format of a novel and the format of an epic story. Epic, uh, specifically when I say epic here in this context, is not about epic fantasy, by, but epic stories like what we have from ancient Greek authors like the Odyssey, the Iliad and all the rest. Because those stories have uh, a specific fascination and a role. As a, as a medium to tell stories because they're set in an ancient past, we know the eventual outcome, we know that the characters serve a specific purpose, purpose as archetypes, and in a way they are trapped in their role in their story. So the fact that, they, that we commonly know, because of common knowledge, what, to, what they do and when they will end up, differentiate the structure of the story from the usual novel that we know, that it is conversely very much steeped in following the decision of those characters and we hope that they will be able to reshape uh, their future because of those decisions. So the, the appeal of those stories is in the character agency. This one, The Curse of the Mistwright, is right in the middle because um, there is a lot of foreshadowing and we know that the characters are forced to do things. I don't want to spoil the story, but the, those two brothers, the one we are following in this novel, yeah, they can make decisions and they can very much influence the outcome, but inside a specific frame. And you have to read the story to understand it. So it is really fascinating for me because of the way this story is trying to, in a way it's in a dialogue, it's, it's in a perpetual dialogue between the classic format of novels and an epic fantasy novel and the way epic, ancient epics work. And it's done really elegantly. <laughs> so, as I told you, I'm just at the 50% mark. I'll let you know more as soon as I finish to read it. I'll probably give you more reading updates uh, in future videos. Then I'm reading Shards of Earth by Adrian Tchaikovsky. And I'm really happy about it <laughs> because uh, I already told you I loved Children of Time. Uh, which is uh, probably his m most famous series, which has won a bunch of awards. And I liked the idea and the concept and the execution. And I liked the uh, difference between the point of view, the alien, let's say, point of view, and the human point of view. But that novel, I haven't read the, 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 the last one, uh, the, the third in the trilogy. Um, and I didn't like the second, <laughs> but the first one that for me can work very well uh, as a standalone too, had a problem, which is the lack of interesting characters on the human side, because the aliens were absolutely amazing, because it was that perfect match between uh, characterization and using an original concept in a spectacular way. So every time we had the alien point of view, I was flabbergasted, dumbstruck. I was absolutely in love with everything that happened, which was complex and difficult to understand, but at the same time incredibly satisfying. So from that moment off on, I was wary of touching on others books from Adrian Tchaikovsky because I need interesting interesting characters, human beings and interesting aliens. And I'm happy to say that this novel, it is everything I wanted <laughs> because we have a bunch of incredibly interesting and fascinating characters that are really relatable, really funny and really dramatic too. There is this perfect blend between complex backstories and a really engaging plotline 
the actual actual plot line in the timeline of the story so this is a, a, about a, um, a specifically two point of views uh, one is called Idris and one is called uh, Solace that have really dramatic past and a really interesting inter interpretation of what humanity could become uh, changing and evolving in the future and it is al also really fast-paced and really funny so this is incredible this is what I was searching for in a new space opera and what I was not hoping to find from in a book from Agent Tchaikovsky yeah I'm just uh, about the 20-25% in but this is really promising and I can't wait to read more and give you a review, absolutely. And the last reading update is about Centauri's Shadow by Ross Garner. Um, I'm incredibly late, <laughs> I was supposed to read this arc months ago, but life came in the way and I'm finally reading it right now. I'm sorry. Mr. Ross Garner, I'm doing my best. <laughs> I'll do I'll do better in the future. Okay, I'll try to be faster when I when I have to read arcs, e arcs. But this took me by surprise in the best way possible because of the of his structure, which is something that we don't see anymore so frequently in space opera and fantasy. This is about a mm, there's a classic idea which is that huma when humanity uh, began to communicate with a um, alien race, it the outcome was a conflict. So there was there were uh, preliminary communication, and we were we were all so happy to find that we were not alone in the future. But then something happened, a tragedy, an attack that was um, that destroyed a lot of, of human lives. When we start the novel, we have a um, a scene that it's really nebulous at the beginning because you don't you can't place it in this timeline of this conflict, and then you you have jump a jump to uh, when humanity is trying to put an end of an end of this conflict eight years after the attack of the main conflict and then you have another point of view 30 years before the attack and then it switches back to eight years after so he has this non-linear structure that it all serves a purpose in the characterization and it all makes the mystery surrounding the alien race and the attacks so much deeper and it can be a little confusing, confusing at moments because a few characters get introduced during this switch, this switch of multiple timelines, and then they disappear and then they come back because of this, because you see what happens after and what you what happens before the attack, and you try to puzzle it all together. And it sounds much more complicated than it is, because I can assure you that as you read it, it all makes perfectly sense. And it is really satisfying when you see the same character being a small child and then being an adult and fulfilling different um, roles in the story. And you, you understand why they um, act in a specific way in the future, because you've seen them when they were very young. And a very strange thing, but it is really fascinating for me, is that one of the main po point of view is pretty much alive in the past, but he is already dead in the future timeline. And you're emotionally connected to, to this character and you ask yourself, what happened? <laughs> How did he die? Why did he die? Did he actually die? Or is he still alive? So this is a huge mystery and it's really fascinating because it reminds me of a few of the mystery box that we have in TV shows like Lost or Fringe with that kind of structure that it is really 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 engrossing and really fascinating for me so i'm around the 30 percent mark on this one and yeah i would love to have much much more free time to dive deep into this novel and finish it as soon as possible but this is really promising and 
uh, unless something really horrible happens that throws the entire storyline and character development uh, in the drain, this is a potential to be a new favorite for me. So I'll let you know pretty soon. Absolutely. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you for being here till the end of the video. You're strong, you're courageous, and you're amazing. I see you. <laughs> and remember that if you enjoy science fiction and fantasy books, this is the perfect place for you. So if you want to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing, leave a like, share this video. But you can see more videos like this right here, right now. Thank you again for being part of this really small and really amazing community and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.